This is a podcast of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Fewer and fewer places on Earth can be considered pristine. From the Caribbean to Antarctica, the impact of human influence is more and more apparent in areas that were once considered so remote or so vast that they seemed impervious to the encroachment of society. Around the world, coral reefs that were once thriving homes to abundant populations of marine life are being threatened by overfishing, pollution, and global ocean warming. Such areas are now being overtaken by algae and bacteria. They now face declines in fish and invertebrate populations and poor water conditions. In fact, scientists now say that virtually all of the coral reef ecosystems that have been studied to date haven't given us a true picture of what they should look like. To find out how coral reefs appear in their pristine state, scientists would need the ability to go back in time prior to the influence of humankind. Or the researchers would have to find that rarest of places, a location untouched by humans or as close to it as possible. In 2005, scientists at Scripps Institution of Oceanography began doing just that. During the Lion Islands expedition, the researchers found a chain of islands in the central Pacific Ocean where coral reef systems could be observed and analyzed as never before. In part one of Paradise Redefined, marine ecologists Enrique Sala and Stuart Sandin described their thousand-mile journey, how it felt diving among sharks and other curious fishes, and what it was like exploring a place like no other on Earth. A few years ago, we were invited by the Nature Conservancy to be part of the Palmyra Research Consortium. Palmyra is an atoll in the middle of the Pacific, a thousand miles south of Hawaii, that we thought was unimpacted by humans. So we decided to join this effort because we thought that that would be a great place to understand what coral reefs look like before we degraded them. We put together a team of 15 scientists from microbiologists to fish ecologists and we realized that Palmyra was located in an archipelago, the Northern Line Islands, with five islands located along a perfect gradient of human disturbance. Kingman Reef, no inhabitants. Palmyra, 20 people. Washington, 900 people. Fanning Atoll, 2,500. And Christmas Atoll, 5,000. So that was the perfect experimental situation to understand what increasing number of humans can do to the coral reef ecosystem. Our expedition was like a trip back in time. We went from a reef that is degraded, it looks like most modern coral reefs, to a reef that is virtually pristine, a reef that looks like the ocean was like before humans started degrading it. The majority of marine ecology today is conducted on appreciably disturbed coral reefs. Most humans have been affecting coral reefs for centuries, and the structure has changed in most locations. For the Scripps Line Islands expedition, our goal was to find out what's been lost, to take something of a time machine to the past for how coral reefs used to look in the absence of human disturbance. Although it's easy to sample coral reefs in places where people are, you can find hardware stores, boats, food nearby to places where people live, and you can study those coral reefs. But unfortunately, we generate a lot of that food from the coral reef itself. So for us to find a coral reef in the absence of human disturbance, we had to find a coral reef in the absence of humans. To get to their Lion Islands destination, the expedition team hired the White Holly, a former U.S. Navy Yard freighter ship. Life on board the vessel was spartan at best, but the researchers didn't mind. They were simply too busy to contemplate their discomfort, and their thoughts slowly became dominated by the next day's dives. The thing that impressed me the most about our crew was the enthusiasm of these people. We did three dives a day for five weeks. We conducted over 800 dives, and there was not a single argument among scientists. There was, of course, a lot of scientific discussion, but it was just a really, really compact team. We had a mission, and everybody was responsible for one piece. And we did the uh, field work. We woke up at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, and we went to bed at midnight for five weeks straight. And everybody was happy, and everybody was absolutely enthusiastic about what they were doing. And when we came back, we got all together and tried to put all these pieces of the puzzle together. And the result was much greater than the sum of the parts. We started with the most disturbed island, and we continued uh, along the atolls with less and less human disturbance. And all that did was excite the scientists. It excited our entire team. Then when we would show up and we f saw our first shark for the cruise, that was an excitement and we popped up and started discussing that. When we saw the coral cover start to increase, when we found new species of fish, of corals, when we were able to document that the water clarity was increasing with decreasing human disturbance, all of the patterns we found 
actually kept us motivated to find more, to learn more, until we finally reached Kingman Reef, which is at the far north and has suffered the least human disturbance of any of the Line Islands. When I dove in Kingman Reef for the first time, I must have felt what Charles Darwin felt when he stepped in the Galapagos for the first time. Animals don't swim away from you. They are not used to see humans. So you jump in the water, you turn around, and you see 10, 15 sharks surrounding you. Your heartbeat doubles immediately. And these sharks are, are with you during the whole dive. And there are red snappers that grow about 80 centimeters that are so curious, and they come and check you and test if you taste good. And these guys beat our ponytails, our ears, our transit reels, our lights. You were very, very curious or mildly aggressive, if you wish. We were used to coral reefs that were dominated by small fishes about this big. Now we go to Kingman Reef, an unfished coral reef in the middle of the Pacific, and what we see is that these fishes are not so abundant. And in contrast, we have lots of sharks and lots, lots of large snappers and, and groupers. So what we find in Kingman Reef is like the Serengeti turn around with five pounds of lion per pound of wildebeest or zebra. I think that the Line Islands expedition, this one and the coming, the coming expeditions, are gonna be remembered for the rediscovery of exploratory science, for the rediscovery of the understanding that we don't know everything that's out there, and for our final understanding that humans have had a hugely dramatic impact on coral reef communities globally. To date, we haven't known this. We've been studying places that are already disturbed, and we think that that's, our, that's the way that reefs should look. The typical diver that goes to the Caribbean may see it one, two sharks and, and think their dive trip was a good trip. They don't realize that 150 years ago, 200 years ago, that they couldn't have even jumped in the water because of all the shark activity that was there. The community was a lot different. What the Line Islands Expedition is offering is that window, that view to the past of the way that coral reefs used to look. Join us for part two of Paradise Redefined as the scientists discuss the results of the Line Islands Expedition. Their discoveries are leading to new ideas about how coral reefs can withstand and rebound from harmful influences. Their data could guide future decisions about marine conservation and ways to preserve marine resources for the future. This is Robert Monroe for Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego.